This is a day of national consecration. And I am certain that on this day, my fellow Americans expect that on my induction into the presidency, I will address them with a candor and a decision which the present situation of our people impels. So first of all, let me assert my firm belief that the only thing we have to fear is fear itself. Nameless, unreasoning, unjustified terror which paralyzes needed efforts to convert retreat into advance. We face our common difficulties. They concern, thank God, only material things. The withered leaves of industrial enterprise lie on every side. Farmers find no market for their produce, and the savings of many years and thousands of families are gone. More important, a host of unemployed citizens face the grim problem of existence, and an equally great number toil with little return. Only a foolish optimist can deny the dark realities of the moment. All right. Friends, Americans, countrymen, and countrywomen, thanks for investing this hour. We come here tonight not to bury the economy, but to transform and resurrect it, thus creating optimism and opportunity for those who live after us. Uh, for the classicists among the audience tonight, that's a little ad adaptation of a speech from Shakespeare's Julius Caesar. Welcome everyone, really appreciate your taking time to be here this evening. I'm Julie Olson, I'll be your moderator tonight. I'm a business owner in the Pacific Northwest and a volunteer with the National Infrastructure Bank Coalition because I believe our country needs public investment in infrastructure. It will help our economy, it will make our US-based businesses more competitive globally, and it will improve the lives of all Americans. We're living in turbulent times. In just the past couple of years, we've lived through a pandemic. Now we face a war, inflation, rising interest rates, global supply chain shortages, and a meltdown of the stock market. The tech segment and in particular, has been hit with the virtual wipeout of multiple cryptocurrencies resulting in billions of dollars of paper losses. Many thought leaders, including Secretary, Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen, believe that the US for too long um, has been overinvesting. Too much of our nation's resources have been flowing to intangible products, financial instruments like derivatives, cell phone apps, software startups that never make it to an actual sellable product, and tech companies valued at billions that never actually turn a profit. This overinvestment in the so-called information or knowledge segment has led to a chronic decades-long underinvestment in tangibles, like state-of-the-art manufacturing plants and infrastructure like roads, bridges, and high-speed rail that would positively impact the lives of millions of Americans. The theme of tonight's webinar is how the National Infrastructure Bank can impact the real economy of things, tangibles that we can touch and see, use in our homes and businesses, stock on shelves in the store, and the real economic benefits that will come from reigniting infrastructure investment across the country. We have a great lineup of speakers here this evening. Uh, we're going to watch a video, uh, then go to our, some of our live speakers. Uh, you see the list there. Uh, we'll do a Q&A after the presentations, and then we'll share the latest National Infrastructure Bank news and updates with you. So with that, I'd like to go uh, to our first guest speaker, Congressman Mondaire Jones, who is appearing via video. Good evening, everyone, and thank you so much for inviting me to speak with you today. I am proud to be a co-sponsor of the National Infrastructure Bank Act because I know that we must act fast to repair and invest in our nation's infrastructure. As I'm sure many of you are aware, our nation's spending on infrastructure has fallen to its lowest level in 70 years. For a country that desperately needs large scale investment in sustainable infrastructure projects, declining investments in infrastructure are simply unacceptable. As a result, productivity and manufacturing have collapsed and we are losing our competitive edge on the international stage. 
you also know that Congress recently passed the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act, which will provide much needed funding for infrastructure projects across the country. And I'm so proud to have played a leading role in getting this bill passed into law. It is the single largest investment in our nation's infrastructure in American history. And still, while I'm certainly proud of this legislation, which is now law, and I worked so hard to get it passed, I also know that it too is not enough. What this country needs is long-term investments in large and small scale infrastructure projects that will only be made possible with the creation of a public bank. The National Infrastructure Bank would be able to finance $5 trillion of projects without adding to the deficit. In fact, except for a very small appropriation from Congress to get started, the NIB will pay its own way, giving it the potential to attract the bipartisan support needed to pass the Senate. When hurricanes Ida and Sandy hit the Hudson Valley, our district was woefully unprepared. We still are. And we know that extreme weather events are only going to become more and more frequent in the coming years. Across this country, regional governments and municipalities have come up with vital infrastructure plans to improve their communities. But because they lack the funding to carry them out, there are trillions of dollars worth of plans that have been backlogged. A national infrastructure bank would give this country an opportunity to proactively invest in climate resilient infrastructure. Investments like erecting state-of-the-art flood control systems for high-risk communities, or building 7 million public housing units, or fixing vulnerabilities in our power grid to prepare for the new era of electric cars. And investments like making sure that our pipes and water are lead-free without waiting for more Americans to experience the effects of lead poisoning. Investments like expanding broadband, internet, uh, repairing existing transit, and even building a high-speed rail. These investments are urgent. They cannot wait for the next disaster. With a National Infrastructure Bank, municipalities will be able to borrow money from an institution whose purpose is to improve the public good and empower municipalities to make the necessary changes to become climate resilient instead of an institution that will profit off of their need for critical infrastructure and environmental resiliency. The NIB will not only improve our physical infrastructure, it will create 25 million good paying jobs to strengthen our economy. I promise that I will do all I can to work with my colleagues in Congress to advance this legislation because I know that the country would be better for it. Thank you so much again for inviting me to speak and for all the incredible work that you've done to create this vision for a brighter future. That was Representative Mondaire Jones from New York. Uh, thanks for sending in the video. Uh, certainly he's an effective communicator for his district. Uh, now I'd like to go right to our next speaker. She is a macroeconomist and former senior economist for the International Monetary Fund, where she spent her career helping countries around the globe get control of their finances. Uh, Alfeca Mutardi, take it away. Um, thank you very much, everybody. It's uh, great to be here. Um, our uh, theme for this evening's talk is to talk a little bit about the financial crisis that we're entering in and how the National Infrastructure Bank can work. Um, what we know, and we've just heard a great talk from Congressman Mondaire Jones. Thank you so much for that. Uh, we, what we know is that our bill in Congress, HR 3339, will create a $5 trillion public bank to lend for infrastructure projects all across the country. And uh, one big difference between uh, what this bank does in a financial sense and what the rest of the banking system is doing is we will make investments into the real economy. This National Infrastructure Bank can only lend for infrastructure projects like roads, water, bridges, rail, affordable housing, broadband. Uh, its borrowers will uh, contract out work for these projects and hire construction workers and builders and um, in manufacturing inputs, uh, which are, will all bolster, again, the real economy. This National Infrastructure Bank cannot lend for derivatives or government debt or other financial things. It on, its funds only go into the real sector. Now let's compare that to our uh, rest of our uh, banking system, commercial banks, 
Uh, they have lent up till now about $4 trillion in municipal bonds for infrastructure spending, but the bulk of their lending was to create financial instruments like derivatives and uh, lending for borrowers to invest in assets like stocks, bonds, and crypto. Uh, this current, this shift in the financial sector away from investing in the real sector was spurred by bank deregulation and overt uh, Fed policy. So in order to explain what happened with our money system, I wanted to say a little bit about how money is created. Uh, and it's a, a pretty simple lesson, but uh, it's the way we used to do it at the International Monetary Fund when we talked about monetary policy with uh, different country governments. Uh, the first step is to have a central bank that controls base money supply. Uh, that is the money that the, Fe that the central bank, which in, in our case is the Federal Reserve, creates. It's something called currency in circulation. And what happens, this is a little picture of the Federal Reserve here, and these are the banks out here, is uh, the, it create, the, bank, the Fed creates money by putting money into accounts of commercial banks that are held with the Fed. Uh, this is called uh, reserve money, and it exchanges this money in exchange for stocks and bonds, which the commercial banks are holding, that the Fed then takes uh, ownership of, excuse me. Uh, so that's about, that creates about 10% of our uh, money supply. That's called base money or M0. Uh, then what happens in the next step is commercial banks add to the money supply. Uh, they create deposits, they issue credit card debt, those kinds of things, and that expands the money supply. They're actually creating 90% of the nation's money supply. And the method that they use is they create a deposit in the borrower's name each time they approve a loan. And our National Infrastructure Bank will do the same. And then they use a fraction of their cash from other deposits to move money through the rest of the banking system. That's this little picture over here. So that creates 90% of our money supply. And the, the objective of monetary policy is to keep the money supply in line with GDP to grease the economy's wheels. The performance target that the Fed uses is to keep consumer price inflation around 2% rising per year, but they don't pay any attention whatsoever to what the effect of their operations are on asset prices. Consumer prices are the real prices in the real economy. Asset prices are the prices for all those houses and stocks and things like that. So what's happened to our, uh, what's the history of our money and our financialization? Uh, it's shown pretty much in this picture right here, uh, which shows you the growth in our money supply compared to the growth in our GDP. And you can see that there was, they moved along uh, uh, with each other up until about 1971, and then they parted ways. And all of this gap in here is financialization. That is money creation that didn't go into the real sector. What happened in 1971 was Richard Nixon broke away from the gold standard, which linked the value of the dollar to gold. And that meant that this money supply was not now unbound. And he was the government was spending a lot for the Vietnam War and the war on poverty. And we had several bouts of inflation during this period. Uh, and then at each time the Federal Reserve had to come and tighten the money supply and that caused a recession. That in 1999, uh, the government rescinded a bill called Glass-Steagall, which separated commercial banking from investment banking. Now they were allowed to recombine, uh, and they uh, then they consolidated and took off uh, and became mega banks, banks that are too big to fail. By 2000, they were they were. Uh, uh, building a lot of derivatives, the dot-com bubble burst. By 2008, we had our first financial crisis since the repeal of Glass-Steagall. Uh, we had uh, a great recession, a bank bailout, national debt doubled on account of all of this commotion in the economy, and there was only a very slow recovery after that. And then finally, from 2008 to, to, to the present, we've had a program called quantitative easing, 
which is where money supply was really escalating and growing much faster than the economy. And it was going into derivatives, stocks, bonds, dollars, corporate debt, and causing all of them to rise in asset prices while inflation was staying still. So what happened in the real economy? It can best be shown by this graph of income inequality. If you put everybody's income into one pot you know, or into a pie plate and then divided it up and show the percent of the pie plate of all the income that was going to the top 1% of earners, then that number went from around 1900 from around 25% down to 10%. Sorry down to 10%, but now here we are at the 1971 inflection point and income inequality has risen back up to where it was in 1900 again. This means financialization in the financialization world, the rich are ch 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 uh, chasing after high yields and creating asset bubbles and the rest of the economy is withering away, manufacturing is dying. We think that the Fed policy has set up the next financial crisis. And this is the graph that shows you exactly why. It's a picture of quantitative easing, which is this escalation of money creation by the Fed. And this picture is drawn, drawn over top of uh, periods of recession, which are these gray areas. So you can see this was the 2008, 2009 uh, recession, uh, which was very long lived. This was the COVID recession right here. And at all other points in time, the economy is generally growing, which means that you don't really need much more money to be created. But the Fed was creating it anyway. This is the money that the Fed was creating. And even when the economy was growing, they kept creating more and more money. Finally, after COVID, we now have rampant inflation. It's running at 8.3% through April of this year. Housing prices are up 34% over the past two years. People are becoming housing insecure. So finally, the Fed is now forced to clamp down on the money supply, squeeze down on this money that they're creating. And that's going to affect uh, the total money supply and it's going to mean higher uh, interest rates uh, companies can't borrow, it's going to cause a recession. This is what happens when the Fed forces down. Now the prospects are very real for a recession. Asset bubbles are bursting everywhere from January uh, 1st of this year through just yesterday. The S&P uh, 500 is down 18%. Cryptocurrencies are down 40%. And the commercial banks are in terrible financial shape. They are sitting on 234 trillion, with a T, trillion in derivatives. That's more than the GDP of the economies of the 10 largest countries in the world. They're sitting on 1.4 trillion in cryptocurrencies, huge amounts of corporate debt, uh, billions of dollars of margin uh, loans that have been extended to customers to bet on the stock market. When the stock market goes down, all of this stuff that is sitting on the bank's uh, uh, balance sheets is going to tank and we could have another severe financial crisis. So what is the National Infrastructure Bank going to do to countervail that? Again, the National Infrastructure Bank creates $5 trillion to lend only to the real sector for infrastructure projects. No financials, no derivatives, no, none of that kind of stuff. It'll all go into the real sector, create 28, 25 million new great paying jobs and lift us out of poverty. So if the, we go into a financial recession, we need to have this bank sitting and ready to go to, to countervail the recession, uh, which could last for a really long time. Uh, we wanna get our GDP growth rate up even higher than it has been in the past. And keep in mind, we can do this all without federal state taxes or debt and no new inflation either. This kind of investment is the best kind of investment we can make for our economy. So as a result of all that, we have been, we have, uh, uh, as the stock market has been swooning, the, the support for the National Infrastructure Bank has been rising. We now have resolutions of support in 25 state legislatures. They've been passed in uh, several, uh, both or one chamber of several states. And in addition to the state legislatures, we have endorsements from all these other groups. So we would like to talk to you today about how we can really supercharge and build on this 
in case we're going into recession, how we can make sure that our legislators, both Democrats and Republicans alike, know what's coming and how the National Infrastructure Bank can help to divert uh, away from a really catastrophic event coming for our economy. Thanks very much. Thank, thank you, Alfeca. Uh, that was sort of a, a nostalgic trip down Econ 101 for me. So uh, appreciate the review. Uh, now what I'd like to do is turn to another one of our esteemed speakers, and that would be Ellen Brown. She is founder and chairman of the Public Banking Institute out of Los Angeles, California. Ellen. Uh, okay, thanks. You're on. Uh -huh. Great, as soon as I get that up. So we have a number of crises that we're dealing with all at once, as the other speakers have said. Uh, we need $5 trillion at least in infrastructure. We've got a debt of $30 trillion, the federal debt, not to mention the unfunded liabilities and individual debts and corporate debts. And uh, ramp, uh, raging inflation right now, price inflation, and an undeclared war in the Middle East or in um, Ukraine. So how are so we need infrastructure, but how are we going to fund it when uh, Congress resists going further into debt? Our founding fathers uh, faced similar crises and they did come up with some innovative solutions. The original money system in the American no colonies was called um, the sorry, I shouldn't have that on at all, was called the um, American system, it involved uh, public money and credit, meaning sovereign money or money issued by the government, credit issued by the government. This was first originated in 1691 when the governor of Massachusetts was fight fighting a border war and needed money to pay his soldiers and didn't have any source for the money. So he got this clever idea of issuing these little paper script, which were supposedly advances against future taxes. And uh, they were accepted in the community as acknowledgement of service rendered to the community and it traded as money. And that worked very well, except for the fact that it was easier to issue the script than to pull it back in taxes. So it tended to uh, devalue the currency. And that same system was used. Uh, oh, sorry. So uh, that worked until King George required uh, or forbade the colonies to issue their own money, apparently leaned on by the Bank of England. Uh, and the result was a depression since our money, so we didn't really have a money supply until then. So that shrunk the money supply and was a major trigger of the American Revolution. Uh, and the, the the Revolutionary War was funded on the American side with the, the same uh, mechanism, paper script called Continentals, and we won. And uh, Benjamin Franklin said, isn't it an amazing thing that uh, we fought a war against the world's major uh, economic power and we won just issuing these paper receipts. But again, by the end of the war, the Continental had been devalued virtually to zero and all the states were in debt, the colonies, which now became states, were in debt. So that left Alexander Hamilton in a bind. He, um, he persuaded Congress to undertake to pay all the states' debts, but with what? So he solved the problem with debt for equity swaps, which is something that's still done today quite often. So he, they rolled the debt into bonds and the bonds could be used to purchase a portion of stock in the first US bank, which then paid a 6% dividend on this stock. And then as Alfeca explained, the, this the capital could be leveraged at 10 to one into credit or um, sovereign money for the country. And that was the beginning of our first, or that was our first currency. So the first and second US banks were basically national development banks. They weren't there for speculation. They weren't there for protecting the banks like our central bank today. Uh, they were there to, for um, industry and development and the most notable uh, infrastructure development of that period was uh, the Erie Canal funded by the second US bank. But the banks were very controversial and Alexander Ham or sorry, um, Andrew Jackson shut the second US bank down. So that left Abraham Lincoln in a bind. 
he was uh, faced as soon as he came into office, he was faced with a war and he was going to have to borrow from the British bankers at something like 30% interest. It would be a huge war debt. So to avoid that, he went back to the um, American system and just issued the money directly with greenbacks. And not only did the North manage to win the war, but um, these greenbacks were largely responsible for a great deal of development, including building the transcontinental railroad, tying both ends of the country together. But of course, Lincoln was assassinated. Uh, the greenback system was discontinued and that left the country once again in a depression in the 1890s. There was a serious banking crisis in 1907. We got the Federal Reserve in 1912, which was supposed to uh, stabilize the money system, but it obviously didn't work because in 1929, we had the stock market crash and from 1930 to 33, the worst banking crisis in our history. And um, Roosevelt, President Roosevelt got in, as we saw in that introductory clip, and in order to rebuild the country, uh, he used the American, an American system bank. It wasn't really a bank. It was a financial institution called the Reconstruction Finance Corporation. Again, it was, um, it was funded, with, capitalized with bonds. It started out with $500 million in capitalization from the government. And with that, um, the, uh, over the 25 years of its operation from 1932 to 1957, uh, the Reconstruction Finance Corporation managed to lend or invest over $40 billion, rebuilt the entire country. They funded only development. Again, it wasn't for speculative purposes, but for things that produce like farms and dams and roads, et cetera. And um, in that 25 years, they managed to rebuild the country and to fund America's participation in World War II or much of it. And they and the bank turned a profit to the government, to sort of a modest profit. But anyway, the point was it cost the Congress nothing, and they did did all this, achieved all these things on the American system. So where does that leave us today? How can we use these same uh, principles today? We, uh, the Federal Reserve's approach to the current inflation is. Uh, quantitative tightening, which means they're reversing their quantitative easing. They're raising interest rates instead of lowering them. They're uh, dumping their bonds and pulling the money back instead of buying bonds and putting money out there. So the idea is to shrink the money supply by reducing the ability of people to borrow, but it's not going to work because the, the real crisis here is not too much money, it's too few supplies, too little goods. There are two types of inflation. There's cost push inflation where um, the costs of producers are rising and so they have to raise their prices. And then there's demand pull inflation where you've got just too many buyers for a single thing, like one house that everybody wants. And so they keep bidding up the price of the house. Well, this is a uh, cost push inflation where we just don't have enough supplies. We have uh, or the original crisis were, were the lockdowns of 2020 during which 200,000 more businesses than the average have were, shut their doors permanently. So these are small and medium sized businesses are where our production comes from, most of it. So they're closed. Uh, this We have supply chain crises. We had the Man the vaccine mandates, which caused a lot of people either to get laid off or to quit. And uh, we now we have sanctions, which are causing global supply issues. And uh, the Treasury and the Fed together pumped out a lot of COVID relief, but they were, so they were paying the unemployed, particularly. I mean, that was a particularly large expense. So the unemployed are still getting money in, but they're not producing, they're not working. So what you have is the demand is still there like it was before, but the supply has fallen off. And um, raising prices is going to, or sorry, raising interest rate is going to make matters worse because businesses need cheap credit in order to produce things. They've got to fund, they've got to pay their workers the materials, they might wait 60 days net or 90 days net or whatever to get paid. So they need credit. And if they can't afford the credit, they will shut down. So we'll have more businesses shut down rather than, they're not gonna drop their prices because they can't afford to 
operate at a loss. So we're dealing with, so what we need is more supply. And that's what we can do with the National Infrastructure Bank. Uh, the Chinese have this figured out. They are the world's greatest producers and, or, you know, they've demonstrated what can be produced and how. Uh, everyone's probably heard that they built 12,000 miles of high-speed rail in a decade. So where did they get the money? The government owns 80% of Chinese banking assets, including four massive infrastructure and development banks. So the, the bank just creates the money as credit, as all banks do, issue, issues the credit, builds the thing, and then the fees from the thing that the, the credit built go back and pay off the loan. So it's sustainable. You're not permanently adding new money into the system. You're putting credit out there to build something, and then it's the credit pays back uh, in the form of fees. So we too could do that. We, and that is the idea of the National Infrastructure Bank. Um, it's capitalized with federal securities like the first U.S. bank, the first and second. Uh, they pay a 2% dividend redeemable in 20 years. And uh, if this is just hypothetical, but if we totally followed the Hamiltonian model, model you could take that $30 trillion federal debt and turn it into a $300 trillion infrastructure bank because you could actually le leverage it at 10 to 1. I'm not saying that's going to happen, but the potential there is huge. And then uh, how this will help with inflation is that in order for the small and medium-sized businesses to get back up and running, we need infrastructure. So we need electricity, we need roads, bridges, and all the water, all those things that we think of as infrastructure, internet, et cetera. So that's all I have. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you, Ellen. That was excellent. I uh, really appreciate that um, overview of the um, banking structure. Uh, next, I'd like to go to uh, Assemblyman Felix Ortiz, former ass assistant speaker of the Assembly in New York. And he would like to talk about our uh, most recent push that the coalition is putting on. Assemblyman uh, Ortiz. Thank you, everyone, and good evening to all, and good afternoon to some who are probably on the West Coast still. Uh, it is a great pleasure for me to be here with all of you. I think that uh, we must take advantage, as we speak here tonight, by reaching out to our local uh, Congress members. Uh, and let me just make a, a footnote about when I say all the Congress members, because it is, uh, I just find out in New York today, that uh, are some Congress people that are running against each other. This is making things very exciting as we moving forward to politics and we're trying to, to get a member to sponsor the bill. And for those of all who has been elected to, to office, we can sponsor 300 bill, but the most important day is the day that you get reelected in that primary or in that general election. Otherwise, uh, it all the effort that has been made will probably be completely destroyed. So uh, that's, I say that because I want to make sure that we all uh, concentrate on the next 60 days uh, that Congress really are, are continue to have their work, uh, to continue to move on their work and to, for us to uh, help to reach out to uh, all the local Congress members as we can to uh, make them to sponsor this piece of resolution. Uh, their sponsorship is very critical at this point. It's very important because the more numbers uh, we get to sponsor this resolution, uh, the better chances we have that the leadership will take note and begin to rethink, including uh, the, 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 the majority leader in the Senate and Nancy Pelosi, Speaker of the, of the House, as well as the President of the United States. Uh, when you see a numbers of Congress people across the nation uh, supporting a particular piece of resolution or legislation, uh, they, they take note, uh, you know, don't, don't worry about it that we already have, that the Congress has already passed uh, uh, the, the Build Back uh, legislation. You know, if it's enough pressure uh, because of the climate uh, and was very well, well articulated by Eileen and Alveca about uh, the issue with the uh, inflation reflection and, and the uh, elements that really are, are cultivating this tension financially that is happening uh, in our country and globally, you know, one of the, uh, when uh, Ellen was talking about demand and supply, I was thinking about the baby formula. Well, the baby formula happened to become another big issue 
uh, when we didn't, when we have COVID that we don't have enough uh, face mask to to protect the people in our country. So now we have to go out of our country to make sure that we be able to have other country to uh, uh, give the United States uh, some of this uh, product that is most needed at this point where we're going to be spending crazy amount of money. So this is like a like a being more reacting than proactive. So this particular resolution for those of us who are new in this call, uh, uh, you know, will really help our local economy. And uh, furthermore, one of the reasons why I've joined this is because uh, this particular resolution uh, would not increase any local, state, and federal taxes. And that has to be uh, uh, reintegrated every time that we have a conversation because most of the people think that is uh, some kind of uh, hiding agenda behind this bill. Uh, and, and the only hiding agenda behind this bill is that Congress really cannot even see how, how supported and how financially this can and helpful this can be to the financial crisis and the dysfunctional that we continue to see in Congress and we have in our country. So saying that, uh, I would like to point out that uh, as we move in forward to some uh, challenges that is uh, that is happening, uh, not only with us reaching out to our Congress people, but also among themselves, because running against each other and two, uh, because they've been redrawing back to a different part of the planet, uh, because they, uh, they, they're having difficulty on trying to uh, get adjusted. Uh, I will make a, a, a very loud call to every single one of us who might have access to Congress people that this is the opportunity that we have. And we should have, uh, like we did last time, a date, uh, 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 a, date uh, to, uh, a date to call on our Congress people where we all come together state by state and all those people who has already a sponsored resolution that we have a day of action uh, or two days of action. We can divide it at 60 day, 30 and 30. That way that we can be very loud and clear to Congress that we are not playing no games. And this is something that will benefit every single one of our uh, uh, states as we uh, as we moving forward. So I think uh, the day of action is something that I will put on the table for further discussion. I think it's very important that we keep our mind very, very clear that uh, it is a lot of primaries against members that live in the same district, uh, whether they're Republican or Democrat, uh, they and and for whatever reason, anyone who has already helped us to sponsor the bill, uh, they might be involved in some of those as well. And you know, we just have a congressman from New York who might be in that situation. Uh, that we just spoke, he just spoke uh, uh, to us today, uh, video conferencing. So, so you know, it's a lot of this thing happening, and I want to be very realistic and real uh, as a uh, in the political uh, arena because I always been very blunt and very realistic that. If we don't get something done in the next 60 days, then we have to wait until next year. And I don't think so the country deserves to wait for next year. So thank you very much. Have a good evening and let's continue to work together and keep the faith. Thank you, Felix. I appreciate your remarks. And I would just like to uh, take a moment to reiterate to everybody that we are asking everyone to mobilize for the next 60 days and to contact your local representatives and senators, uh, urging them to uh, get on board with HR 3339 as a co-sponsor. We um, have some announcements that we'll be making about um, new additions to our co-sponsor list. So of course we're thrilled about that, um, but, but we need more. And we are especially looking for Republican co-sponsors. And then of course we need a, a champion in the Senate to introduce the bill into the Senate. So, and, and our group is uh, setting up meetings and talking every day to, uh, to members of Congress. We don't care what party they're in, um, but we're looking for people who who want to support this investment in infrastructure for the United States. So uh, let's move on to our next speaker. And that would be Assemblywoman Shannon Bilbray Axelrod of Nevada. Shannon? Hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, good. Um, coming to you from Las Vegas, uh, we reached our first 100 degree day here. So thank you, May. Uh, uh, thank you for having me. Um, I introduced AJR7 in the last legislative session 
We in Nevada meet every other year for 120 days, which makes it really fun. Um, and I have to say, I was able, um, this was a totally bipartisan resolution. And uh, I think that's what I'm gonna talk, uh, what I've been asked to talk about um, a little bit. Uh, obviously infrastructure, everyone loves it. Why wouldn't they? But I think um, most of the Republicans who signed on, uh, at least in Nevada, were, you know, true, true, uh, I guess they call them Reagan, Reagan Republicans, right? That, that, you know, very worried about the debt, very worried about spending um, in the truest form, I'll say. So I, I won't make any smarmy comments. So sorry about that. <laughs> um, but yeah, so I was able to get um, several Republicans, both in the Senate and in the Assembly. Um, and our committee meetings went great. We had people, like I said, coming up and testifying on both sides. Um, if you are just working on a resolution or something, Alpheca is phenomenal um, and was and made me look very good. <laughs> um, as far as the last assemblyman, I really appreciate that because I think a call to action is the perfect idea. If we can figure out one or two days in the next 60 days that we can, um, you know, have everyone we know have calls. If we can connect people, I think that's a great idea. So um, I would All right. be I'm really in for that. And if we could figure out how we um, can do that, but I don't know what else to say. Sure. I loved carrying this bill. Um, I something I believe in, and I every time I'm in one of these meetings, I learn more about um, the history of of the banking system, which is phenomenal as well. So, uh, you know, I think Al, uh, Hamilton, the play started this obsession for lots of us and uh, it just continues. So I think I can get a, even a lot of young people to um, to take part in that call to action. So, um, but just remember if you're in one of those states that, you know, has, I'm, we're very lucky in Nevada, we have um, pretty much all Democrats. I'm lucky because I'm a Democrat. Uh, and so it's very easy, but if, if you just keep in mind, um, if you can connect with people, I mean, I love to find policies that we can work together on um, and show show really folks out there. I, I say this all the time, I, you know, this idea that we all hate each other, it's just not true. Um, and so anytime that you can sort of, um, you know, call on our, our, our angels to kind of have kumbaya moments. I was, I was wrapping up, so. Okay. All right. Okay. Thank you. Uh, I would like to go to Randy Grine, who is from Washington State. He's with the 48th Legislative District, uh, where he is the Democratic Rules Committee Chair. So, Randy, uh, did you have some remarks for us? Uh, yes, I do. I, um, I, I wished I had a, uh, more graphics than this, but uh, it, it will do. Uh, just a few things, mostly from my perspective, because I've lived in Washington all my life, and Washington is a very mm, split state. We have some of the richest people in the world that live, well, where I live, and then we've got uh, some very poor people uh, out in some of the rurals and not so rural areas. Um, that's a lot of my concern. Um, I think we've, we've gone over what uh, what some of the previous infrastructure banks have done. Um, uh, around here, we like to point at the dams, uh, Grand Coulee uh, and Hoover, of course, down south. Uh, but there were a lot of other dams that are are fundamental to, well, what, uh, what we in Washington uh, know is uh, cheap hydropower. Um, uh, over 90, what is it? 95% of our electrical uh, generation is already green. It's, you know, it, it's, uh, and it's because of this kind of, in, uh, of investment. Uh, the national highway system, everybody knows about that. That's the kind of thing that we're looking to put together. Um, but there's a few things that maybe not everybody knows are, uh, were sponsored by the government. Um, I, I'm, in, uh, I'm in tech, I'm a uh, network engineer. So I know the entire story about how the internet was created. It was a project funded by DARPA, the uh, Defense Advanced uh, Research uh, Group. And it was designed, it, it was a, a puzzle, design a network that will survive a nuclear explosion. Very simple. 
that was originally for uh, for uh, research uh, uh, research and universities, and it allowed an enormous flood of information that had positive results for everybody. That's a money generator, just in case people right. don't know. Uh, information is huge. All right, we'll do. So um, what fewer people know is that Al Gore uh, in, in the 80s browbeat and cajoled and wheedled and begged the rest of Congress into funding what they called then Internet 2, which was let's connect, let's increase the connections, let's make sure everybody can get on, make sure that that the uh, commercial interests can use this platform to get to customers. And can anybody imagine today what we would be like if if that had not happened, if if DARPA had not produced uh, produced the technology and and Congress had not authorized the seed money to get a, to get a decent connection to, uh, for well the most important areas in any case um, well so this this kind of infrastructure has obviously created a, a tremendous amount of wealth uh, but locally we see we, we see this inequality uh, in the area because the rural areas got nothing We've got people out in Grants County who, until uh, 20 some years ago, couldn't get a landline to their house because farms were two miles plus apart. The uh, the legislature uh, pushed through a pushed through a, a new bill to allow public utility districts to to put in infrastructure and resell bandwidth to care to basically become a carrier. And so that other companies could provide internet access, telephones, cable, all the things that we need. And it shows it showed up almost immediately in two important areas that I'm familiar with. One is Moses Lake, which has grown hugely, and the other is Shelton. I've got a uh, I've got a work friend there who has had high speed internet for decades when I wasn't able to get anything like that until about uh, eight years ago. And I live next to Microsoft. So, and what, what we're talking about is investing in the future. We all invest in things. Um, we, we, go, we go and buy money to, to invest in a house. We go, we go and borrow money uh, for, for a car. That's how people do things. Businesses do it too. The government should. And what is it going to do? I'm, I'm wrapping up here quickly. Green energy. There's there's a lot that, there's a lot of uh, replacement we need to do to to get off of uh, fossil fuels and this is a great way to do it. We need we we've got roads that are falling apart, bridges that are falling down. We had one fall down in this state about six years ago, uh, and it fits in with with just about everything that this state at least is planning on doing for uh, to provide uh, long term funding for. Uh, for state and local organizations, uh, government organizations. So in, uh, in conclusion, this is going to be not just a good thing to do, this is going to be a money maker, a money generator. And that is, uh, th there is no downside to this, well, except for uh, the financial industry, they're going to take a small cut. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Randy. I appreciate that. Um, I do briefly want to say that I'm very familiar with Eastern Washington and some of the issues that we have there. And so some of those small towns like Moses Lake, for example, used to be sleepy little farm towns. And now they've suddenly become popular. And the, the average price of a home in Moses Lake has gone from like 100,000 to most recently like 450,000. And that means for businesses like mine, I operate in those areas. You can, it's very difficult to hire people because they can't move to those towns because there's no affordable housing. And recently I saw in the Spokane, Washington newspaper that uh, places like Sandpoint, Idaho, which is a resort town, some of the employers there are having to resort to buy and or build their own housing units for their employees. Otherwise, you can't get employees to work for you. So 
you know, this uh, public investment in housing is going to hugely benefit the private sector and workers, of course, and it's going to allow them mobility to move around the country and to find the best opportunities for them. But anyway, I, want, I do want to move on and uh, get to some more of our speakers. I do, I do see we have uh, another representative on the phone. That would be uh, Casey Ohibosim. And yes. Uh, would you like to make some comments about the National Infrastructure Bank? Oh, I'm just uh, very um, happy you know, to be here at the same time. Uh, of course, we do actually need it, of course, with the infrastructures that we see, especially within uh, the minority communities, does need to, um, we need to do something about it, whether it's the um, underground, you know, pipes, bridges, you name it. Most of these are kind of like old infrastructure, but we need we need a will, we need a political will that actually will get this uh, forward. So um, whatever whatever needs to be done in terms of contacting um, our uh, federal delegation to let them know the importance of actually supporting this particular uh, movement. So uh, just happy to be here and also you know listen to the colleagues and on the um, uh, people presenting with respect to this uh, infrastructure bank, National Infrastructure Bank. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate that. Um, and I do want to make one more point here real quickly, and that is that the projects that would be funded by the National Infrastructure Bank are those that are prioritized and picked by the local community. So this is not the National Infrastructure Bank evaluating the entire U.S. community and deciding, oh, we like that project or we like this other project. This is going to be up to the local communities to determine where their priorities are and then um, moving forward with the projects that make the most sense and have the most public support from their area. Okay, um, so next I would go, I'd like to go to, I believe we have Representative Willingham from North Carolina on the phone. Okay. Uh, the only thing I want to say is that uh, I'm still excited about what's going on with the National Infrastructure Bank and the resolution that I presented here in North Carolina. Of course, it got passed in uh, one of the committees and it's in another committee now, and, and really it's not dead. And I'm hearing more conversation uh, you know, about both sides, from my friends on the uh, left and on the right, uh, about being supported. So hopefully when we go back in session and we are in our short session now, we just came out of our long session, but we're restricted the kinds of things that we can introduce or discuss in the short session. So really uh, we go back into our long session which comes in January. Uh, I think that's when we'll probably get some traction because all the things that uh, I've heard that we're talking about, uh, broadband, for instance, we put uh, in our last budget, we put over $200 million in that uh, and still looking for money that we think we might get from the feds that we can use uh, to progress that, progress in that area. Uh, my district, which is a rural district, is about 1,600 square miles. So I spend a lot of my time in the car going from place to place. And at the same time, we know that in the rural areas, uh, we have real spotty broadband. And that's something that uh, the state has recognized and we're working on it. So, uh, and I think along with the broadband, of course, we have the housing crisis too, but that's something we're working on. So I think with all these issues that we're facing now, uh, it's becoming more apparent that we need something like the Nas National Infrastructure Bank. So I'm optimistic about the fact that uh, we will have some serious discussions and perhaps, uh, you know, we will have uh, something passed in North Carolina. Uh, and, and that's what I'm working on. And I'll continue to work on that. So, and I applaud all you guys for the work that you're doing. And, and hopefully this will be fruitful for us in the very near future. Thank you. Thank you for those remarks. I'm sure everybody probably saw those dramatic photographs of those houses crashing into the ocean there on the outer banks. Oh, so yeah. it's, uh, you know, indicative of uh, how climate change is affecting areas uh, there in North Carolina. Uh, At any rate, okay, uh, next I would like to go to uh, Mayor Ray Leon. And are you on the line? And can you tell us where you're from? And Sure, uh, my name is uh, Ray Leon. I'm the mayor of the city of Huron, also the executive director of the LEAP Institute, Latino Equity Advocacy and Policy. And uh, I'm the mayor, I think the only mayor in the Valley that's built a bridge. 
Uh, and so I'm a lover of infrastructure, mostly because of the fact that communities like my own, which are environmental justice communities, have been overlooked, undermined, and always ignored in terms of our infrastructure needs. And it's always about the, the, the cost, right? So if we have a national infrastructure bank, uh, that structure, the way uh, it's being spoken of, then it's a huge investment that's not a cost, right? But that builds it out. But we need to make sure that in the language for the NIB includes the priority populations that have provided the labor to feed the country, but not have got, got gained the benefits of, of, the, uh, of, of, of our labor, you know? So that's, uh, that's my quick intro. Mucho gusto. From the heart of the valley, you're on California. Gracias. Um, I do want to say that I have now been empowered to uh, let you all know the important announcement that Senator Tallman was going to announce, and that is that Representative Stansbury is co-sponsoring the bill, and Congresswoman Fernandez has called him to announce that she is also co-sponsoring. So uh, let's like give a little uh, shout out to Senator Tallman for his work on uh, getting those two co-sponsors. And so uh, again, what we're looking to do is to try to get up to 20 here in the next 60 days. So um, it's really wonderful to, um, to see these additional people um, jumping on. And the other great thing is that now they're starting to call us instead of us having to call them. So that's always a much better situation to be in. So uh, thanks to Senator Tallman for affording that good news. Um, then I would like to call on uh, Representative Chase, who is from Washington State. He's been active in the chat and has making, been making some comments about uh, how Republicans would look at this bill. And could you share with us um, how you think we might best communicate with Republicans to get some Republican co-sponsors? Well, I, I've been um, excited about uh, public banking since I led, read Ellen's book 10 years ago. And I could see how it could work, but then you know we've tried it in Washington State and it never gets anywhere because uh, it gets gets too busy because people start talking about stuff Republicans don't consider as um, infrastructure, which is um, you know student loans, and I know North Dakota does that, but uh, you know people see public public banking, especially from my side, they see a hammer and sickle a lot of times, but still. You know, I, I am familiar with what happened, you know, with FDR, and uh, I do think we are entering a big economic crisis, and this might be a way out, you know, because I do believe we have to help the helpless, which there's going to be lots of helpless people um, in the in the near future, maybe, too. So I'd like to see this happen, but at least it kind of doesn't happen. You can't just don't, don't jump into the deep end. I think you have to um, tailor a way that it will pass a lot of these uh, legislatures, and like I, on my chat, I was saying, um, you know, they're talking about affordable housing, which is great. But I think this bank, if it, if it can come to fruition, will cause affordable house, housing, you know. And I think that's what happened in the Depression is, you know, uh, Roosevelt was in a depression already. And then he, you know, got his, um, you know, dream, brain team together. And then, then they uh, thought up all this stuff out and they, you know, helped. It took, well, it didn't really end until after World War II, but it did, um, you know, put a staunch or a tourniquet on what was happening then. And so I think we do need to uh, be open-minded about everything, but we don't want to scare off people we need to make this thing pass. So I would say there's, you know, if we can tailor these bills and I'm trying to look at uh, maybe a bill for a state bank that might be more acceptable to my party, at least uh, try to get more people on board. I know we're running out of time, but, um, you know, to make it more acceptable to everybody and, and start down that road. Wonderful. Thank, thank you for those comments. I think it is really important that um, that this bill be bipartisan. After all, uh, both Republicans and Democrats drive on the roads, cross the bridges, uh, and uh, I think would appreciate high-speed rail. And certainly, um, just speaking for the business community, I feel that there's so much investment that needs to be made um, that will uh, provide opportunity for the business community. And I think we need to continue to stress that in our presentations. Yeah, and we have a, bit, a lot um, of so projects in like Washington to, State that need ahead. a lot of dams that are, you know, 50 year life, that are, you know, they're ready to be replaced, you know. So how do we do that when, um, 
a lot of the money that could go for infrastructure is, uh, you know, we've, we've doubled the budget in Washington State. Washington State's grown 13% population-wise in 10 years, but we doubled the budget in 10 years too. So that's why people are kind of leery of this. But if they know it was paid for itself, it was privately funded, uh, if we get that across to them, there might be more adherence to it. Right. Uh, good point. Uh, okay, I would like to take a moment to uh, go to Lou Spencer. He is a, a union official. One of the, um, the items that we've talked a lot about with the National Infrastructure Bank is uh, job training programs, apprenticeship training programs that would give people the skills that they need to move into these good paying jobs. So Lou, could you come on and make a few remarks on that? Yes, uh, can you hear me okay? Yes. Yes, the uh, National Infrastructure Bank, HR 3339, uh, would create a lot of jobs for uh, building trades people who uh, would participate in apprenticeship programs. And uh, those apprenticeship programs uh, would train people on the job and in the classroom related training. And these are lifelong careers. We talk about jobs, 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 and what we really need to be talking about is careers, careers, careers. Apprentices go on to become journey persons, and then they be going, they go on to become foremen, supervisors, project managers, and owners of companies. So uh, the National Infrastructure Bank will uh, grow businesses and create opportunities for numerous people all across this great country. Thank you. Thank, thank you for those comments. I know as a, a business owner that's looking to hire people, I'm uh, really hopeful that this next crop of uh, high school graduates and college graduates are gonna come out and are gonna be looking for jobs and are really gonna be able to help ease the, the labor shortages that we see out there. And talking about a career instead of a job is a really good point. Okay, uh, are there any questions from anybody on uh, in the audience? Um, please raise your hand. And I'd be happy to uh, recognize you. Uh, any questions from anybody at this time? Okay, S seeing none, then when I, oh, there we have one from Carl Peterson. Carl? Yeah, this is for Althea. I'd like her to look at her crystal ball and tell us when she thinks the US will recognize that we have entered into a recession. So technically, uh, this is measured by uh, the government statistics that collect information on the gross domestic product. If it goes negative in any quarter, and then a, a second quarter is also negative, this defines a recession. Uh, a, a recession. We, we did go negative in the first quarter of January 2022. Mm -hmm. uh, if, if the second quarter goes negative, we will be in a recession. It's not likely not to do that. But the more that the Fed squeezes down the money supply to, uh, um, to contain inflation, and the higher the interest rates go, the, uh, the more likely it is that everybody will quit the stock market and businesses will not borrow. High mortgage prices have already impacted the housing market. Uh, which uh, sales are way, way down. So we've got a lot of really bad warning signs right now. The only good signs uh, in, the, in the economy are that consumer price spending is robust and the t labor market is relatively tight, although there's a lot of churn in the labor market. Poor people have not been able to you know, get wage increases that are commensurate with the inflation. And a lot of people are still out of the labor market. So those are not good signs. But uh, the, the, the bad news is if we slip into a recession, what's going to happen to the banking sector, which is teetering, who, their books are just teetering on the brink. If we slip into a recession and a financial crisis like we did in 2008, it's going to be a really, really bad scene. Sorry. <laughs> hmm, that doesn't sound good, Alfeca, but thank you for your answer. Uh, okay, I'd like to go to Dennis Montoya. Dennis, um, what's on your mind? Good afternoon, everyone, or good evening. Um, I'm in New Mexico. So we now have two out of three of our congressional delegations supporting the National Infrastructure Bank. 
And I think when it comes to convincing, we have been working on both of these Congress people for a number of weeks, but when it comes to convincing people to finally get on board, I think we have to take into consideration community circumstances. Teresa Ledger Fernandez just had the largest wildfire in New Mexico state history burned through the center of her congressional district. And Melanie Stansbury, uh, who actually signed on just before uh, Teresa Ledger Fernandez, has been uh, touting infrastructure for quite some time. There's going to be a lot of rebuilding necessary because of these environmental catastrophes that are sadly going to become more and more frequent. And for those of us who advocate for the creation of an NIB, it is a selling point and you just saw it work. That's what I had to add. Thank, thank you very much, appreciate that. Um, okay, now I'd like to um, go and look at a few more slides. I had promised some announcements, so we're gonna go to those. First of all, I'd like to uh, point out what you see here that uh, California, our resolution has been introduced. So it's really exciting to see this taken up in California. And uh, I think you've heard from people around the, the country, East Coast, West Coast, in the middle. And so it's really great to have California on board and looking at our resolution. Next slide. Um, here's another supporter uh, resolution passed by the Borough of State College, Pennsylvania, supporting the National Infrastructure Bank. We have a very, very active group in Pennsylvania. And um, so it's been uh, really great to see the, the number of resolutions that have been passed by local government entities there. Next slide. Oh, here's something uh, really important that we're doing. And um, we have uh, some very generous supporters who have been uh, donating, and this has allowed us to place ads in newspapers around the country. And our most recent digital advertising is in Roll Call, which is a publication, digital publication that goes to thought influencers and leaders on the Hill. And um, I'm not exactly sure what their uh, their number of views is per day, but it's it's large in the thousands. And again, these are. Um, people who work on Capitol Hill. And so this is an example of the kind of advertising that your donations are going to support. So we have, uh, this is running right now, and then we're working on some additional uh, publications uh, that, that we wanna go into, including one for the, it's uh, I believe the National Conference of State Legislators. So they have an annual meeting uh, for state legislators. Again, a very influential group, bipartisan. And we want to um, uh, do some advertising for that meeting that's coming up this summer. So if anyone was so inclined and wanted to visit our website uh, and help us out on uh, uh, getting that ad place, that would be fantastic. Okay, uh, next slide. And here we go. Um, call your member of Congress to co-sponsor HR 3339. Again, our goal is to get up to 20 sponsors in the next 60 days. With the momentum that we have going, we think it's possible. And certainly with your help, we can march towards that goal. Uh, next slide. Um, we've talked a little bit about this, but we have uh, had resolutions passed around the country by a whole variety of different groups, cities, counties, uh, organizations, and so um, it's been really gratifying to see the level of grassroots support that we have, but what it really comes down to is we need members of Congress. So that's that's what that's where we're at now is we need members of Congress to sign on as co-sponsors and particularly Republicans. And so uh, if you're from a state that has a Republican congressperson or senator and you would like some help in engaging that person, we would be happy to set up a meeting. Uh, our folks are setting up meetings around the country on a, on a daily basis, pretty much, and we are happy to set up a meeting for you in your home state. And so here you see our contact information, our website, our Facebook page, our Twitter, our email, our phone number. So uh, please give us a shout. We'd be very happy to work with you in your state or your county or town 
to raise awareness of the National Infrastructure Bank. So I believe that um, brings us to the end of our meeting today, unless anybody had any final comments uh, they would like to make. But otherwise, I'd uh, like to thank Alfeca and Ellen Appreciate Brown for time their and attendance and all the work that you're putting in all to of our speakers. the National we Infrastructure really Bank a reality. So thank you, everyone, and uh, we'll call it an evening.